want a war, you're gonna get one. Now get the gun, the drugs, the magic. Interrupt your regularly scheduled program for this special report. I was up all night. <laughs> Hey yo, welcome to episode 97 of Reliving the War and welcome to the 18th of August 1997. Raw's live tonight from Atlantic City, New Jersey, while Nitro takes place in Birmingham, Alabama. We're going to do what we always do and watch Raw and Nitro head to head and see who had the better show. Big update guys, and I wanted to put this at the start of the video for those who don't watch the whole way through. Next week and the week after, WWF Raw is War is not on the USA Network, Nitro goes unopposed. So here's the schedule for the next few weeks, all going well. Print it out, email it to yourself, stick it above your bed. The unopposed Nitros and the additional Clash of the Champions and One Night Only shows means our normal schedule's completely messed up, and I really have my work cut out for me, but now you know the game plan, and now you know what's coming up next. Again, all being well. You'll also notice WWF Friday Night's main event on the schedule, these shows went on instead of Raw, and honestly, comparing these to Nitro just wouldn't work seeing as Friday Night's main event had the same format as Saturday Night's main event, with the big headliners starting the show off and the event ending with mid-card guys. It just makes more sense to cover these in a separate video. So that's where we're at guys, it's gonna get pretty busy. You can help me though by hitting subscribe and hitting the bell icon because as convoluted as this is, you'll still get a notification when a new video's ready. Plus, you'll be helping the channel. I'll be working quite consistently on this schedule too, and early versions will be available on Patreon, so if you want to see everything before everyone else, jump over and have a look. Right, we're all on the same page then, hopefully. Let's get started with episode 97 of Reliving the War. Nitro opens up with a video of Raven talking about Raven things. He's banging on about his father never loving him, how he's misunderstood, destroying everything that's beautiful and shutting yourself off from society. Thanks Raven. Tony Schiavone announces a tag team main event at the beginning of Nitro, The Outsiders vs Lex Luger and DDP. We're also going to see The Giant vs Kurt Hennig tonight. Over on the USA Network, this is the final Raw before Ground Zero in your house, even though the event takes place on September 7th. So it's going to be interesting to see the final Monday Night hype for a pay-per-view that's still weeks away. We start off with a Rick Rude promo on Raw while WCW put on a Road Wild rematch, Vicious and Delicious vs Harlem Heat. You want to start with Rick Rude, don't you? <laughs> Me too. Rick gets in the ring, he orders his theme music to get cut, and he'd like all these fat out of shape Atlantic City sweat hogs to button their lips and open their eyes. It's time to hear what a real man has to say. Vince McMahon wants Rude to discuss his new role in the World Wrestling Federation. Rick says he's an insurance salesman, short term, long term, life accidental. You supply the buck, Rick Rude supplies the bang. Rick Rude was paid a handsome sum for his services last week, you can never have enough insurance, and Rude doesn't let us know if it was Triple H or Shawn Michaels who paid the fee last week. McMahon says this is the oldest racket in the book, Rude is simply offering protection for money, and Rick says to get the premium, you got to pay the premium, it's kick or be kicking. If you have the funds available, then someone's in for a rude awakening. Good stuff, nothing given away here in terms of Rick's true motivations, it just seems like he's a henchman for hire and HBK benefited from his services last week. It's great to see Rick Rude back on TV here though and I'm looking forward to seeing more of his short WWF run in the coming weeks. This is the first of two Road Wild rematches we're getting this week on Nitro. Harlem Heat defeated Bagwell and Norton at the pay per view so let's see how things turn out here. The lovely Jacqueline brings Harlem Heat to the ring while the lovely Vincent's here with Buff and Norton. 
Buff Daddy wants to pose a little before locking up with Big Stevie Ray. Stevie ends up performing a hip toss, and Buff, in the most animated fashion possible, accuses Stevie of grabbing the tights. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Bagwell then pulls off a hip toss of his own, and as always, he impresses himself more than anyone in the arena. Man, I do like Buff Bagwell. Stevie hits Buff with a falling power slam before tagging in Booker. Buff quickly tags in Norton, and Big Flash takes Booker out with a jumping shoulder block. Booker replies with a spin kick. Stevie comes back in, but Buff Bagwell lends Norton a hand from the outside. Some awfully bad timing next when Vicious and Delicious go for a double back elbow, and Bagwell steps forward too early, making Norton completely miss the move. Bagwell misses an elbow drop, so in comes Booker T to clean house. Booker hits a Death Valley driver on Bagwell, but Norton breaks the pin. All four men get in the ring, and then we get an incredibly flat finish. Bagwell and Norton get DQ'd when Vincent jumps on the apron, just when things were getting good. Booker T again cleans house, he takes out everyone, including Vincent, and that's your Nitro opening match. Over on Raw, Sergeant Slaughter and Shawn Michaels are having an argument backstage. Old Sarge was caught with HBK's fanny pack, and Shawn's like, yo, you owe me some money, homeboy. On Raw, we have Owen and Davey taking on LOD. WCW presents The Barbarian vs. Mortis. Look at the crowd signs at Monday Night Raw. It looks brilliant on TV, but I'm not sure I'd be too happy sitting in the audience with a big Andy 316 sign in my face all night. Fuck Andy. Someone has a real beef with Kmart too. Do you want to hear something really upsetting though? This is the last time we'll see Owen and Davey tag up on WWF Raw. They do have the upcoming Fatal 4-Way match at Ground Zero, which the WWF are still promoting Steve Austin for. But yeah, get ready to say goodbye to Owen and Davey as a tag team on Reliving the War. They go out in style here though. Owen and Animal started off and initially, the Road Warrior gets the best of the King of Hearts. Hawk then hits a neckbreaker on Owen, but he finds himself on the outside after hitting the ring post shoulder first. And now it's time for Davey to shine. Bulldog does some damage at the ring steps, allowing Owen to hit a backbreaker. Davey gets tagged in, he lands a vertical suplex, snapmare, and boom. Davey Boy Smith Chinlock. Davey threatens the fans in the audience with chin locks, and here's hoping Andy 316 gets taught a lesson in the deadly arts of chin foo. Also, chin locks in a tag match, Davey never stops surprising us. Owen comes back in and he hits a second rope elbow drop. We see some classic heel double team action. Bulldog comes back in and he and Hawk go down after a double clothesline. We get Owen and Animal again in the ring and Owen goes down after a back body drop but he replies with a spinning wheel kick. He goes to the top rope but Animal catches him with a power slam. And then the Godwin show up. Yay. Animal gets whacked with the slot bucket, but this allows Owen to successfully pin the Road Warrior. Owen and Davey win their last match together on Raw. We get a brawl with all three teams, but the crowd stays silent throughout. It's then announced that Shawn Michaels is gonna team up with Triple H tonight to face The Undertaker and Mankind. Just a few weeks back, this would have seemed like two very unlikely tag teams, but here we are. HBK says the WWF are still giving him the shaft. He wasn't supposed to face The Undertaker until Ground Zero, but Vince McMahon is feeding HBK to the Lions tonight. Sean says he doesn't want nor need Triple H as a tag team partner, but if the WWF are so hell-bent on painting Sean in a corner, then the WWF will get what's coming to it. Ooh. Mortis took a loss to the Barbarian on Nitro. It's kinda shit that the Mortis character is now receiving back-to-back -back losses on TV after coming across so well in the Blood Runs Cold Angle. Canyon was damn good in the ring, and the damage had already been done to the Faces of Fear thanks to the late Dungeon of Doom stuff. I think Mortis should have been given a little more here, but he and Wrath will take on the Barbarian and Ming at Clash of the Champions, so we'll see how that turns out, I guess. A big boot puts Mortis down for the three count. Wrath gets in the ring after the bell, and Barbarian gets nailed with the death penalty. Ming then shows up, and we see the death grip. That's a lot of death right there. Vandenberg and Mortis have to pull Wrath to safety, only <laughs> they don't. They pull Wrath out so hard that the big man takes a nasty bump on the floor, and Wrath is visibly pissed off afterwards. He doesn't sell the death grip. 
and he even pushes Vandenberg as he gets back to his feet. Brilliant. The commentators reveal afterwards that Lex Luger and DDP will not only team up tonight, but they'll also team up at Clash of the Champions, and they're going to face two members of the New World Order. That match ends up being the main event of the evening, and it's Scott Hall and Randy Savage who represent the NWO. Eric Bischoff then comes out and he invites everyone to his party, Thursday on TBS, the Clash of the Champions. He says the tag team champions Hall and Nash are going to be there, and so is Hulk Hogan. Absolute lies, ladies and gentlemen. Eric then says Larry Sabisco isn't allowed within 50 feet of him just like the giant. He says the NWO has been a little too patient with JJ Dillon, and Bischoff makes a demand. He wants JJ to bring this to the executive committee. The NWO want their own television show, and Eric Bischoff wants to do commentary for those shows. Stevie Richards vs Scotty Riggs is up next on Nitro while Flash Funk battles Brian Christopher on Raw. That's definitely your grandma's church hat that Flash Funk has on there, not that there's anything wrong with that. This match came about due to Christopher wanting to wrestle a heavyweight, so the WWF went with Flash Funk. <sighs> body slam and hip toss from Christopher, body slam and hip toss from Funk, drop kick to the outside and baseball slide from Flash, some sweet gyrating from Funk. Christopher comes back with a full Nelson face crusher, followed by a drop kick to the back of the neck. We then see a Northern Lights suplex, a jumping hook clothesline. Christopher goes upstairs and his dad tells him to hit a pile driver, but this distracts too sexy. He gets his little grandmaster smashed on the top rope, 450 splash from Flash Funk, and it's over. Whew. Christopher and Jerry argue after the match, and it looks like Brian isn't too happy with his dad. After the match, The Undertaker cuts a brief promo where he says his patience with Shawn Michaels has run out and HBK won't make it to the pay-per-view after tonight. The Phenom also tells his tag partner, Mankind, that the dead man doesn't forgive and he doesn't forget. Taker tells Foley not to step out of his line in tonight's main event. Over on TNT, Stevie Richards has his Nitro debut match. He stays in WCW until December. Scotty Riggs has ditched the American Male's entrance music and this was a big mistake. Stevie gets an unfair advantage at the beginning of the match with a poke to the eye and Riggs makes Stevie pay with a running clothesline. Scotty's follow-up monkey flip didn't look too hot, but his clothesline afterwards certainly did. You don't hear many people praising Riggs for his dropkicks, but I'll do it right now. These looked great. On the outside, Riggs gets thrown into the ring post and back inside the ropes, Riggs gets rocked with a Stevie bomb. Riggs kicks out and he fights from the mud, building up a comeback by hitting a back elbow, another clothesline, and a suplex. Scotty then hits a sidewalk slam and it looks like Richards is in trouble. He turns it around very quickly with a Stevie kick and just as he pins Riggs to win the match, Raven shows up. Raven gets in a WCW ring for the very first time, and he hits Richards with the even flow DDT. Raven sits in the corner as Tony Schiavone announces a Raven vs Stevie Richards match for Clash of the Champions this week. I'm looking forward to that one more than anything else at the moment. The Sultan takes on Ken Shamrock next on Raw, while the Horsemen take on Double J and Eddie Guerrero. The Outsiders cut a promo too on Nitro. Triple H and China are seen arguing with Sergeant Slaughter. Vince McMahon says they are apparently trying to get out of this tag team match later tonight. The best thing about the Raw match was the Iron Sheik getting involved. Sheiky Baby took a belly to belly suplex from the world's most dangerous man, and it got a good reaction from the audience. Ken was also able to hit a belly to belly on the Sultan, and the match ends with a Frankensteiner followed by the ankle lock. Sultan tops out, and Kenny Boy's push in the WWF continues on. After the Patriot defeated the Sultan a few weeks back, everyone would start beating him, including Shamrock right here on Raw, and Flash Funk and Vader on Shotgun Saturday Night. On Nitro, an NWO promo airs with the boys celebrating their upcoming birthday party. The party's gonna take place at Clash of the Champions this week, so make sure you come along this Sunday and we'll celebrate it together. As a quick spoiler, something pretty cool happens at the end of the Clash. Double J and Guerrero get interviewed before their tag team match, but they don't get a chance to speak because... I can't wait to be alone with my baby tonight, das Wunderkind with his Wunderbratwurst. Oh, big Alex Wright interrupts the interview and apparently he asked Deborah on WCW Saturday Night if he can join Jarrett's little clique here. Alex says Deborah shouldn't be a loser, she needs to recruit Dad's Wunderkind. Deborah says Alex is handsome, he's German, he can dance. Great observations there, Deborah. 
But the problem with Alex is the fact that he doesn't have a title. Alright, two things. Eddie Guerrero doesn't have a title either, and isn't Alex the cruiserweight champion? Did he lose the belt? Let me check. Yeah, he lost the belt. He lost the title to Chris Jericho on WCW Saturday night. Damn it. Alex says he's gonna get himself a new championship belt and he'll be right back to finish this conversation. Unfortunately, Alex would never hold the cruiserweight title again during his WCW tenure, end of an era, but there are other championships that Alex could win. Mongo and Benoit defeated Jared and Guerrero and Deborah dropped the US belt on the outside. Mongo picked it up and he smacked Jared with it, allowing Chris Benoit to score the pinfall win. The Outsiders then came out to cut a promo, remember Hall and Nash will take part in tonight's main event. Scott Hall says it's another sellout tonight, everyone across America is watching TNT and it's all for one reason, everyone can't get enough of the NWO. Nash says Birmingham is most definitely NWO country, WCW's gonna send out two j Brones later, Luger and DDP, and the whole world is gonna find out why the NWO is just too sweet. Do you want to learn how to fight? Do you want to win world championships? Some would say the WWE Performance Center is the place to be. Others would say the New Japan Dojo is where you'll learn to bust heads. But if you want to become a legend, if you truly want to become a fucking man, then you need to visit Casa del Frosty Balls. Grandmaster Sensei will teach you the art of ice-cold kung fu. You'll learn chronic kicks, deadly punches, and of course, super cool special moves like the freeze attack and the ice slide. If you're too much of a little pussy wussy and you can't attend Casa del Frosty Balls for some intense training, then you can still grab a t-shirt and pretend you've attended the dojo. Not only will people stop fucking you around when they see this sick shirt, but you'll also help Grandmaster Sensei pay his child support. Visit chinlocks.com today, get the shirt, and be the coolest dude in the neighborhood. Casa del Frosty Balls, where legends are born. Our second Road Wild rematch is up next when Six battles Ric Flair on Nitro. On Raw, the Nation of Domination cut a promo. That great looking newcomer is with the nation and my my, the WWF sure did get themselves an absolute diamond with this one. He does look familiar but it must be my imagination. The boys demand that Jim Ross conducts this interview and not Vince McMahon, good choice. Farouk kicks off the interview by explaining why he kicked Ahmed out of the nation. Farouk says underneath Ahmed's skin was a white man trying to get out. Apparently Ahmed wanted to be pretty like Shawn Michaels and he wanted to be like Steve Austin. I did not get those vibes at all when Ahmed was in the nation but okay. Farouk says Ahmed was weak just like Savio Vega and Crush. At Ground Zero Farouk says he'll play Genie and grant Savio and Crush a wish, he'll compete in a triple threat match and he'll kick their asses. Farouk then says this newcomer right here tried to do things the right way but it got him nowhere, and this guy soon realized that joining the nation would mean big things for his career. Farouk's implying that this boy worked in the WWF before but man it must have been way before we started reliving the war. Look at how good this guy looks though, absolute megastar. He says the fans once chanted die rocky die and that does really sound familiar too. He says this isn't about the colour of his skin, it's about respect. He then says he became the youngest intercontinental champion in history. So let's check that out, uh, nope, nope, nope. Fuck off Rocky Maivia, it's Rocky Maivia, you fuck the job guy. Man look at the state of this guy trying to be all cool with the nation, what a loser, this guy isn't gonna achieve jack shit, bring back Savio Vega. Rock says he heard Rocky sucks all the time, you're welcome by the way, and Rocky may be a lot of things but sucks isn't one of them, so Rocky Maivia isn't a sucks guys. Maivia says the fans are jackasses, Rocky and the nation demand respect and they'll get that respect by any means necessary. All joking aside, this is a well remembered promo and it's a turning point for Rocky Maivia. Thank god, we can drop the whole Rocky's a jobber thing from this point on, because Maivia's work gets better and better with each passing week. Crush from the dirty old asshole shows up on the Titantron, he challenges the nation to a fight in the parking lot, the boys show up and then they have a big old brawl. 
It ends with the Bariquas stealing the DOA's motorcycles. I like how the DOA actually catch up to one of the Bariquas at the end of the segment and nothing happens. Not gonna go into detail with Ric Flair vs 6 this week, we covered this one already at Road Wild and this match is kinda similar. 6 was able to surprise Flair a few times in the early portion of the match, but it was Ric's experience that kept the nature boy in control. Shivani announced during the match that War Games at Fall Brawl will once again feature a WCW vs NWO battle, but the teams haven't been decided yet. Six got another chance in this match thanks to some quick footwork and Flair even took the Bronco Buster. The second attempt though was not successful. Flair softened up the leg, he went for the figure 4, but then the NWOB team got involved. I'm still trying to work out exactly what happened here, but anyway. Flair gets jumped by Bagwell, Vincent and Norton. Kurt Hennig runs down to help Flair and the NWO get out of the ring. After the bout, JJ Dillon and Nick Patrick get interviewed by Mean Gene. Dillon says that Patrick has publicly explained his decision to disqualify Rick and Scott Steiner at Road Wild, and after the WCW Executive Committee reviewed the tape, they all agreed that Patrick really had no other choice, so the matter is closed. Patrick feels the committee wasted their time because they should already know that Patrick is a fair referee based on his actions since leaving the NWO, but Patrick still thinks Randy Anderson's decision during the Road Wild main event needs investigated. Randy comes out and he says Nick has no right to point the finger at anyone. Dylan interrupts the referees by saying the interview is over. The Parka takes on Ultimo Dragon on Nitro next for the TV title while Brand Pillman battles the real Double J on Raw. A drop down leapfrog sequence starts the Nitro match off and Leparka takes a monkey flip. He manages to whip Dragon into the corner but he takes a back body drop immediately afterwards. Dragon then performs his corner headstand and Leparka is all like, look at this guy. Dragon kicks Leparka away and then we see Ultimo Dragon's kick combo, absolute domination from the TV champion. It continues on with Dragon countering a backdrop, Leparka gets dropped kicked out of the ring and then Dragon dives from the top turnbuckle to the outside. The Parker gets in the ring before Dragon and so Sonny Ono gets in a few cheap shots. The Parker finally does some damage after whipping Dragon into the steps and back inside the ring Dragon takes a power bomb. And check this out, Dragon gets hung up in the tree of woe and Mark Curtis tries to stop the Parker from hitting a spinning wheel kick but the Parker is too fast. It ends with Ultimo Dragon hitting his top rope Frankensteiner, he then goes for the sleeper but Sonny Ono jumps on the apron. Leparka takes advantage but the master plan falls apart when Ono accidentally kicks Leparka. We see the dragon sleeper again and then we see Mark Curtis's shooters. Oh. Oh, Mr. Ono be upset. Ultimo Dragon retains the belt. Tony Schiavone then announces that Alex Wright is next in line for the TV title. That match is gonna take place at Clash of the Champions. I do like me some Ultimo Dragon but I'll be rooting for my boy Alex Wright all the way. On Raw, Triple H isn't very pleased about this main event match tonight, he references the curtain call when he says this is another case of Sean doing the crime and Triple H doing the time. But if Vince wants a war with Helmsley, just like he seemingly wants a war with HBK, then Trips is happy to cause Vince a lot of problems moving forward. We then see clips of Goldust Marlena and their daughter Dakota playing on the beach before the Pillman vs James match. Brand Pillman is still wearing the dress because he still hasn't won a match since Summerslam. Road Dog, uh, yeah, he gets a bit handsy and nobody finds it funny. Not the commentators, not the fans, and definitely not Brian Pillman. The comedy ensues when James pulls the dress up and Brian Pillman goes crazy. James gets the shit beaten clean out of him and even when he gets a chance to make a comeback, he completely messes it up. Pillman finally has a chance to get out of the dress but Goldust comes down to the ring and he elbows Double J, meaning Pillman loses via disqualification and Pillman must continue to wear the dress. Goldust gloats to Michael Cole but Pillman grabs a mic and here we go, this is when this feud actually picks up. Brand says Goldust would probably like the loose cannon to disappear and Goldust agrees. Brand says if Goldust beats Pillman in a one on one match, then Brian will leave the World Wrestling Federation. But if Brian wins, then Pillman will get Marlena for 30 days as his personal assistant. Goldust says it ain't gonna happen, he won't put Marlena up as a prize. Pillman then lets Goldust in on a little secret. He says there's a big part of Bran around Goldust all the time because Dakota is Pillman's love child. Goldust dashes down to the ring while Bran says it was good a few times and Marlena ends up accepting the challenge on Goldust's behalf. Goldust can't believe it and he wonders why Marlena is so eager to accept. Pillman just laughs as Raw moves on to its next match.
Kurt Hennig vs The Giant on Monday Nitro, The Patriot vs Vader on Raw's War. Kurt starts the Nitro match off the right way by slapping that big stinky Wharton fested giant across the face. Check out Curtis's reaction to the slap afterwards, I'll never be able to say enough good things about this fine referee. Giant throws Hennig into the corner but Kurt stays on the big man with a few hard chops. He doesn't have the strength to whip the giant though so he takes a headbutt and he gives fans a glorious sell afterwards. Giant tosses Kurt from one side of the ring to the other and Giant gets a little payback with a hard slap to the chest. Kurt tries to fight back again and this leads to another magnificent sell job. Giant hits a suplex and he signals for the choke slam, and then Eric Bischoff comes down waving the restraining order. Why is Eric effectively helping Kurt Hennig by the way? Bischoff wants Doug Dillinger to enforce the order but Doug tells Eric that Bischoff can get arrested too for violating the order. This is not a one way street. Giant isn't doing anything wrong, so security won't be taking any action against the big man. Eric tries to walk back up the entranceway but Larry Zabisco shows up. There's nowhere for Bischoff to go except over the barricade. The giant then grabs Eric and he pulls him out of the audience. I don't think this is how restraining orders work but fuck it. Nitro then takes a break as Eric rolls around on the floor. The giant can't catch Bischoff because his hands are too greasy or something. Zabisco stands there doing absolutely fuck all. On Raw, Bret Hart stands at the entranceway as his ground zero opponent, the Patriot, has a match with Vader. The hitman waves the Canadian flag as Vader lays in the forearms. The big man crashes into Captain America in the corner and a short arm clothesline leads to the number one contender hitting the mat hard. Patriot comes back with a jumping clothesline and you know that spot where a wrestler slides out of the ring only to trip his opponent up and deliver the old ring post nut shot? Well Patriot has some trouble with the sliding part of that particular spot. Vader takes the nut shot and Bret Hart's watching on as if to say whoa this is shit. Vader comes back with another clothesline and a splash. The Patriot gets wailed as Bret continues to watch the match with the highest amounts of disinterest. A Vader bomb attempt gets countered by the Patriot and Dale Wilkes tries to build a comeback. He hits a DDT, he only gets a two count, he then runs into a brick wall called Vader and an absolute miracle happens in the ring when Patriot just recovers just like that. He hits the uncle I ain't got the jam slam and he wins the match. I still can't get over how hard the WWF were pushing this guy. I'm not saying he was bad, I'm just saying it was so out of the blue. Patriot talks shit to Brett and this leaves him wide open for a Vader sneak attack. The big man brings Patriot back in the ring, he goes for the Vader bomb, but Vader isn't too happy with Brett draping the Canadian flag over his ground zero opponent. So Vader breaks the flag, he chucks it at Brett and the hitman and Big Van Vader go to war. You know, I'd much rather have seen Vader vs Brett at ground zero. The Hart Foundation come out to lend Brett a hand and when the Patriot wakes up, Brett gets out of the ring. The hitman laughs as Sergeant Slaughter sends him back up the entranceway and he then flexes at the top of the ramp. Yeah, that was it. Steve Austin's gonna answer a few questions next in regards to his health and career while JJ Dillon cuts a promo on Nitro. So, after last week, you'd imagine that JJ now knows exactly what Sting wants. The commentators know it, the fans know it, but no, James J. Dillon hasn't got a fucking clue. He recaps what's been going on, he talks about Sting ripping up contracts, how WCW wants to rebuild their relationship with the icon, and he says he has no contract tonight for the Stinger because, get this, he doesn't know what Sting wants. Dylan says if Sting can't tell us what he wants then WCW and Sting may have to go their separate ways. That's a bit harsh isn't it? JJ says the Stinger has from now until Clash of the Champions to let the committee know exactly what he wants and who he wants to wrestle. The Stinger then shows up, he walks through the audience, he gets in the ring and he grabs JJ Dillon. Sting points to signs in the audience, signs that say Sting vs Hogan or Sting wants Hogan. He then goes to the outside and he picks up one of those signs and he shows it to JJ. JJ stands there like, oh is that what he wants? Fuck I never would have guessed. So there, it's official, Sting wants to wrestle Hulk Hogan, let's see if Dylan can understand this simple request next week. On Raw, Jim Ross interviews Steve Austin and Stone Cold isn't in a great mood. You really do get the feeling that Austin was still legitimately pissed off with what happened at Summerslam and you can't blame him either. Austin says the WWF put him in this hotel room yet they didn't bother to call him after he got hurt. He does have a fruit basket though and he offers some fruit to JR. Bret Hart could have made some jam with that Steve, fucking don't throw it away. 
Steve says when he got dumped on his head, he couldn't move his arms or legs, it was scary. Doctors told Austin that he should maybe look at doing something else for the rest of his life and give up pro wrestling, but Stone Cold says that ain't gonna happen. Steve says he's seeing the top spine doctor in the country tomorrow, but it doesn't matter what he says. The bottom line is, Stone Cold makes the final decision and Owen Hart is still gonna get the shit kicked out of him. Stone Cold's words by the way, not mine. Austin says he'll take a few weeks off, he got a bit depressed watching the SummerSlam match over and over again, but he sees his career continuing on, he's been doing this for 8 years, the pile driver won't stop Stone Cold, it'll only slow him down. Austin says he's gonna show up at Ground Zero, he doesn't know if he's gonna compete, he doesn't know if he'll forfeit the WWF Tag Team Championship, but he will be at the show. Great promo here and as mentioned, you can really sense Austin wasn't happy with his current situation. And again, who could blame him? Hunt this one down online though and give it a watch. It's a very real WWF promo and it's one of Austin's best. And we've reached the end of another episode of Reliving the War. We wrap it up with tag team matches, so called reluctant partners Shawn Michaels and Triple H versus Mankind and The Undertaker, and we have The Outsiders taking on DDP and Lex Luger. I reached out to you guys to come up with a name for the Luger and Page tag team, and let's see what we've got here. Lex does Dallas, DDP Yoga and Client, Bang Bros, <laughs> Banged Package, Total Diamonds, The Diamond Package, Diamond Rack, Brawn and Bang. The Stretch Express, Self High Five My Package, <laughs> Positively Packed and Racked, Fail the Package, <laughs> Jesus. The Package Cutter, Yoga Flex, The Lex Luger Needs a New Tag Team Partner After Stinging the Giant, Vulcan and Cutting, DDPY, Yoga Roids. <laughs> <laughs> DDP is such a nice guy, I can't think of anything derogatory to say about him. Totally positive, diamonds are for Luger. Flex ED, <laughs> before and after Vegas. Save me DDP, the coal mine, but I'm gonna go with total bangers, suggested by Tim X on YouTube, good job. Kevin Nash thinks the NWO theme song's a total banger as he grooves while walking down to the ring. And here we go, a star studded main event tag team match on Nitro. Hall throws the toothpick in Luger's face and Lex replies with a slap. Hall's unfazed as the two go in for a lockup and Scott gets the better of Lex. Luger then brings Hall to the opposite corner and Randy Anderson has to break the two up. Hall pushes Lex, Lex pushes Hall right back, so Scott brings Luger to the outsider's corner and check this out. <laughs> Don't you just hate it when that happens? Big Sexy gets tagged in and what follows is a ton of time wasting. Lex starts putting up the diamond sign and so does Nash because why the fuck not? Looks like the total bangers are popular in Birmingham. DDP and Nash then have a standoff or a sit off while the crowd goes absolutely nuts but Paige goes down after a knee strike. He comes back with a swinging neckbreaker that Nash took brilliantly but a hard clothesline puts Paige down again. DDP takes the big boot, Hall comes back in and he hits a followaway slam. Nash then gets back in the ring and he stops Paige from tagging out. The outsiders then begin cheating behind the referee's back. The audience is absolutely loving this match, they try to will DDP back into it during an abdominal stretch and even Nash pays attention to how loud it's getting in the arena. But the outsiders are playing a smart game tonight on Nitro. Luger is so frustrated that he keeps distracting the referee and this allows the outsiders to maintain their advantage. Hall slows it down with a sleeper and it stays locked in for quite some time. The audience again goes nuts when Paige shows signs of life, but once again the tag gets cut off and this is one of the better hot tag builds we've seen in a long time. DDP hits a fucking head scissors takedown and then… <laughs> that's wonderful. Basic, basic tag team wrestling, but if you do it right it's so effective. Unfortunately this is exactly where our match ends because the NWO hit the ring and it's a DQ finish, uh, I know right? Ric Flair comes down to help the total bangers. But check this out, the giant hits the ring and Nash doesn't back down. The crowd pops and <laughs> my my. This is how Nitro ends, if you want to see more WCW action, tune in to Clash of the Champions later in the week on TBS. Sean dances in front of China while Hunter looks on wishing he could move like that. HBK also wants a kiss, but that doesn't happen. The Undertaker and Mankind make their way down to the ring and the Undertaker's pyro freaks everyone out. Sean then lets a fan know exactly what he thinks about him, or her, as Mankind and Hunter start the match off. 
Hunter goes down after a back elbow and a clothesline, HBK gets taken out by Foley and Sean's careful not to get too close to The Undertaker. Mankind then has to fight his way out of the heel corner as Vince McMahon wonders how effective Sean and Hunter's gonna be as a tag team. Taker gets tagged in and Sean runs away. Hunter's the legal man so Helmsley steps back inside the ropes while HBK gives his partner an advantage on the outside. Taker manages to backdrop Hunter on top of Sean, and Sean tries to retaliate with sweet chin music but he doesn't get all of it. That's a nice way to say he completely missed. Sean gets tagged in and he lands a few punches on Taker before tagging right back out. When things get a little sketchy, HBK calls for his insurance policy and Rick Rude walks down to the ring before we go to break. When we come back, Mankind applies the mandible claw on Helmsley but China comes to the rescue. Another ring post nut shot on Raw's war. HBK comes back in and we see the flying forearm. HBK then makes a blind tag and we see some good teamwork from this duo that would eventually become known as D-Generation X. On the outside, Mankind gets thrown into the ring steps as McMahon says HBK and Triple H are better coordinated in comparison to Foley and Taker. Sean gets tagged in again, he hits a jumping back elbow before taunting The Undertaker. And much like the Outsiders match, Sean and Hunter do well in keeping an unfair advantage. Quick tags keep Foley from tagging out, HBK hits the elbow drop, he warms up the band, but he walks straight into a mandible claw. Hunter tries to save his partner and he goes for the pedigree, but it backfires and Hunter gets his little king of kings smashed with Foley's head. Taker gets tagged in and he goes to work on Helmsley. Hunter ends up getting clotheslined over the top rope and Michaels gets punched from the apron to the guardrail. On the outside, Rick Rude goes to hit Taker with a chair but Taker sees it coming. Rude gets in the ring, Taker ends up hitting Hunter with a choke slam, and that's when Shawn Michaels jumps in the ring and Taker gets smacked hard with a chair shot. Unlike SummerSlam, that one was completely intentional. Taker gets busted open, but Sean shows no mercy. Undertaker gets hit again, and Sean looks down at the Undertaker wondering if he maybe made a mistake. Triple H and HBK then leave the ring as the Undertaker sits up, and Raw ends with replays of the first chair shot. Raw wins reliving the war this week. I love the energy in the arena during the Nitro main event, but Raw again put on a significant show featuring The Rock's first heel promo and Triple H and HBK beginning their run as a team. With this victory, Raw now has 42 points, Nitro has 43 points, and we're on 12 ties. In the TV ratings, Nitro won with a 4, Raw got a 3.2. Remember guys, we won't have any head to head shows for a few weeks. Next up is Clash of the Champions this Sunday, so please join me then and we'll take a look at the final Clash show. And then, next week, we'll look at the first of two Unopposed Nitro shows. After we're done looking at the Unopposed Nitros, we'll then take a look at both WWF Friday Night main event broadcasts, and then we'll get back to normality a little with head-to-heads and pay-per-views. As always, a big thank you for joining me, and I hope you're looking forward to the next episodes in the Reliving the War series. Take care.